All right, let's dive a little deeper into pressure volume, PV work. So I want to think about variations in pressure. So in one of the experiments I showed you previously, we considered a gas doing work on the surroundings by expanding against an external pressure that's lower than the internal pressure. And so the work that was done here was minus the external pressure times the volume change. But what if the external pressure isn't a constant? So in that case, I actually need to integrate my work from an initial pressure to a final pressure. I need to know how is the external pressure varying as the volume is varying. That is, work is going to be minus the integral from the initial volume to the final volume of the external pressure dV. So that's completely general. What I would need to know is how is P external varying along some path where the volume is varying. <coughs> In the case of the constant external pressure, of course, it's consistent with the equation we've looked at before. As a constant, it would simply come out in front of the integral. That becomes the integral from Vi to Vf of dV. So of course, that's just delta V. That's completely trivial, and it's consistent with the general expression. That's good. But I want to emphasize that work is the area under a curve defined by P external as a varia with variation in volume. So uh, I've got this one-dimensional integral. And if I think about an isothermal compression at constant pressure, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw, I've got on these graphs volume on the x-axis in liters or cubic decimeters. I've got pressure in atmospheres or bar. They're close. They differ by 1%. I guess they say bar. So I have pressure in bar. Uh, for an ideal gas, I would have this curve. right? I've got that pressure is equal to nRT over V. So pressure is going as 1 over volume. And the work is equal to the shaded area that will be underneath an external pressure curve. So here's a constant external pressure. I'm going to start at a pressure of 4 bar, and I'm going to compress my gas, which starts at a lower pressure, and a volume of 1 liter. I'm going to compress it until its internal pressure, which is dictated by this ideal gas line, is also equal to 4 bar. And the work I do, it looks like that happens when I get to half a liter, the work I do will be 4, because that's the external pressure, times a half, because that's how far I traveled in volume, that's delta V, so 2, 2 uh, liter bar. That's a unit of energy. Now, had I, in fact, had an external pressure of 8 bar instead of uh, 4, and I stop when the internal pressure is equal to 4 bar, how much work did I do? External pressure is 8. I go over a half. I'll have done 4 liter bar worth of work. I did more work. I was pressing harder, even though I stopped at the same point. So the reversible isothermal compression is something I want to talk about. And I want to make clear that work depends on the path that's taken from V1 to V2. So you just saw an example where I got two different works for doing exactly the same thing. I compressed a gas from one liter to a half a liter. And that gas must have been at the same temperature because it had the same PV curve. Now, let's imagine a so-called reversible process. So here in red is what you saw in the last graph. It is a constant external pressure. And it's the constant external pressure that involves the minimum of work to do the compression. Why is it the minimum? Because it's the pressure I needed to get right to the end. At the end, my internal pressure of the gas is equal to the external pressure. The second example I showed on the last slide, I had excess pressure. I didn't need that. OK, but now imagine, instead of just starting with this four bar worth of pressure, I actually start down here with about 2 bar of pressure. Right? And I know it's 2 because this is an ideal gas, so PV is a constant. right? It's equal to RT. So 2 times 1 must be equal to 4 times a half. So here I am at 2 bar. And imagine I just infinitesimally increase my pressure to 2.0000, as many zeros as you want, 1 bar. 
So I'll press my piston down a little bit, and then another infinitesimal little bit, infinitesimal little bit. So I'm going to move along this PV curve that characterizes the ideal gas relationship. That defines the reversible path, the infinitesimally small increases with infinitesimal movement of the piston. <coughs> so remember my general expression. The reversible work, I'll emphasize it's reversible by putting that subscript on work, minus V1, integral V1 to V2, the pressure, and now the external pressure is equal to the gas pressure. That's what it means to be reversible. I'm not in some massive excess. But the gas pressure comes from the ideal gas equation of state. It's nRT divided by V. So let me just plug that in. Now I have minus the integral from V1 to V2, nRT over V dV. So I'll pull all the constants out front. That's minus nRT, integral V1 to V2, dV over V. That's an easy enough integral to solve. It's the logarithm of V. And when I take the definite integral limits, I'll get that the reversible work is minus nRT log V2 over V1. Notice I am compressing my gas. I'm making it occupy less volume. So V2 is smaller than V1. So I'll be taking the log of a number less than 1. That'll make it negative. This is a positive value. It's temperature. This is a positive constant. This is a positive constant. This is negative. So the net will be positive. Two negative numbers multiplied times each other positive. The work is positive. That's what I want. I'm compressing a gas. I'm doing work on the system. So it's all hanging together. What about the opposite, the reversible isothermal expansion? So in this case, I'm following the same reversible path. I am infinitesimally pushing the piston up as I expand to a final pressure. And let me contrast that then with the maximum work I could do against a constant external pressure. So here would be the constant external pressure that gets me to my end point. So it's 2 bar in this case. So the most work I could do would be 2 times a half, because I'm traveling over a half a volume. The most work I could do would be 1 liter bar. On the other hand, on the reversible path, where I am slowly decreasing the pressure from this initial uh, level, again, I'll get the same integral, minus V1 to V2, nRT over VdV. Here's the logarithmic solution. Except that now V2, the final volume, is greater than the initial volume. So if V2 over V1 is a positive number, the log is positive, the whole work is negative, consistent with the system doing work on the surroundings. And the integral under that curve obviously is bigger. The shaded area here is the constant external pressure. But we would add this extra work when we follow the reversible path. All right, so let's pause for a moment. I'd like you to uh, look at some different PV uh, expansions or compressions and see if you appreciate how they differ in terms of the work involved. So I'd really like to cement home this uh, difference between a reversible path and a non-reversible path. And I'd also like to emphasize the reason we've been talking about isothermal processes is because we want to take advantage of this relationship for an ideal gas that if the temperature is constant, then P times V is a constant. Right? It's because PV for an ideal gas is equal to nRT. So N and R are constants. If T is a constant, then PV is constant. And so I'd just like to illustrate, imagine again that we're expanding an ideal gas from half a liter at 4 bar to 1 liter at 2 bars. And one way we might do it, I'll actually draw an experiment here. Imagine I've got this mass, and it's enough of a mass to press down with 4 bar worth of pressure. And it's sitting on top of a piston, and when I take it off, the piston rises, and it leaves 2 bar. So the piston, if you like, weighs as much as the mass that you've got. Two bar out of the piston, two more bar out of the mass. So the constant external pressure in one step would consist of just lift that first mass off. And so you immediately have an external pressure of only two bar, that's the piston, and you will expand from one half to one liter. And so you'll have done two bar times half a liter. You'll have done one liter bar. And if you look up the conversion of liter bar to joules, that's minus 100 joules. Minus because we're doing work on the surroundings. So you did minus 100 joules worth of work. Well, let's imagine instead of a single mass that was pressing down with two bars worth of pressure, 
I have two masses, each of which is worth an addition is worth a bar. And so the piston plus the two masses is still a net of four, but I'll take them off now in steps. So I go from four to three. And so I'll travel along until I hit the curve, which will be because uh, PV must be a constant. It'll be at 0 0.67 liters, because 3 times 2 thirds is 2. And I'm always along a curve where PV equals 2 in this case. And so I can integrate under that curve. And now I take the other one off. So now I'm moving from 0.67 out to 1. So that's 2 thirds times 2. That'll be 4 thirds. And this was 3 times a third. I guess that all comes up to uh, 7 thirds, something like that. Uh, when you turn that into joules minus 117 joules. So you got more work out of the system by doing it more slowly, not just ripping the bar off, the weights off, but taking them off in two steps. So the reversible path basically imagines, I don't have a weight here, I have a pile of sand. And I'm gonna take that sand off one grain at a time. It's gonna be a slow experiment, but it's gonna be a reversible experiment. So with each infinitesimal little grain relieving the pressure, the gas is going to expand, 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 doing work, raising that piston. And I will end up with, if you integrate under that curve, if you actually compute the logs, you'll get minus 139 joules. So illustrating that work depends on the path. It depends on how you change that external pressure. All right, well, that completes our first look at PV work. In the next lecture, I want to consider this from a somewhat more mathematical standpoint and talk about differentials and state functions. However, before we get to that, let's uh, take a look at an, another demonstration, and in fact, one that will illustrate the kinds of work that gas can do in the presence of temperature differentials, for instance, which give rise to pressure and volume changes. Hopefully you'll find that interesting. Have you ever tried to polish silver in order to remove tarnish? It can be a lot of work with a physical polish, rubbing every square centimeter of surface. Some of you might know that you can also immerse silver in a hot solution of sodium bicarbonate, that is, baking soda, that also includes immersed aluminum foil. That's an example of an electrochemical process that can be described in fascinating detail using thermodynamics, but that is beyond the scope of this course, unfortunately. However, there's another approach that one might employ, and one that we already have the thermodynamic tools necessary to understand. The tarnish on silver is silver oxide, that is, there is a small layer on the surface of the silver where oxygen atoms have bonded to the surface to form silver oxide, which instead of being a lustrous metallic color, is dark and opaque. Tarnish on silver can also be silver sulfide, but we'll ignore that complication here. Oxidation of silver in air at room temperature is driven by enthalpy. It is exothermic to react oxygen from the atmosphere with metallic silver to generate silver oxide. However, the process clearly is unfavorable from an entropic standpoint because free molecules of oxygen are removed from the gas phase and their atoms tied into the solid. Thus, at sufficiently high temperatures, we should be able to reverse the spontaneity of the reaction and use entropy to overcome enthalpy and drive silver oxide to become silver and molecular oxygen, thanks to the favorable entropic release of molecular oxygen. Let's see if that works. I have here a fabulously tarnished piece of silver. Pretty ugly, isn't it? But now I'm going to light this torch and try heating it up. Notice, as it's warming, getting hotter, I see oxide disappear and whiter metallic silver reasserts itself. Pretty, isn't it? Because this silver is rough and not polished to a uniform layer, we don't see the luster that we could otherwise achieve for metallic silver. 
but certainly the loss of tarnish is evident. Unfortunately, if I let it cool down in air, the reaction returns to its normal room temperature direction, and I end up with tarnished silver again. To avoid that, I'd have to put the hot silver into an inert atmosphere, that is, one lacking in oxygen, and let it cool. Of course, it will still tarnish at room temperature, too, but the reaction is slower at the lower temperature, which is why people don't have to polish silver every day. So if you have a torch and a box full of argon, now you know a simple way to polish silver. Or you might want to try that electrochemical trick instead. <laughs>